right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April installment of the South Atlantic LCC's Third Thursday Web Forum. My name is Hillary Morris, and I work on Blueprint User Support and Communications for your cooperative. Each month, we host this Web Forum featuring a presentation on current and ongoing work throughout the South Atlantic LCC. It takes place every third Thursday of the month, hence the name at 10 a.m. and serves as a great chance to ask questions and provide feedback to help guide the future of the South Atlantic LCC. So each web forum has basically the same overall agenda. I'll start out by introducing our presenter who will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, and then following the presentation there will be plenty of time for questions. And we'll spend the rest of the webinar on updates from your cooperative followed by an open discussion. So before I hand things off to Dr. Anderson and we get into the heart of the webinar, I just want to go over a few logistics. Um, to minimize background noise, I'm going to mute everyone during the presentation and put us in silent mode. So if you have any questions, you can either type them directly into the chat box, and I'll keep an eye on that, or you can hold them until after the presentation. And if you do use the chat box and want everyone to be able to read your question, just remember to send the note to everyone. And to speak at any time, all you have to do is press star 6 to unmute yourself. So before I mute everybody, does anyone want to speak up with questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. The conference is now in silent mode. So presenting today, we have Dr. Mark Anderson, who is the Director of Conservation Science for the Eastern U.S. Region of the Nature Conservancy. And he's going to be talking to us about TNC's Southeast Resilience Project, which, among other things, lays the foundation for one of the South Atlantic LCC's ecosystem indicators, which we call Resilient Biodiversity Hotspots. So Dr. Anderson, I'm going to pass presenter power over to you to get us started. So you can share your slides and just remember star six to unmute. Okay. I just unmuted. Can you hear me, Hillary? I can hear you great. Okay, great. And let me share. Looks good. Okay. Okay, well, hello everyone, and thank you, Hillary and Rua, for inviting me to present. Uh, I'm going to present the work that, uh, well, I'll, I'll go, you'll see who all helped with it. A lot of people helped with this work, and it's indicated as we go through it. But it's basically a project that we've worked on for many years in the Nature Conservancy to identify areas that we think will be more resilient to climate change and, and protect their biodiversity and functions even as that biodiversity and function change over time. So again, just to set the stage for what we've been thinking about, uh, I like to use the least controversial uh, graph that I could find on climate change. And here it is. This is a really interesting graph on the left here from the insurance companies just on the rise in billion dollar disaster events. And you can see that as uh, since 1980 to 2014, there's been a huge rise in uh, severe storms, floods, cyclones, wildfires, droughts. Um, and as people wrestle with, you know, how are we going to adapt to this changing climate, the natural world has to also uh, uh, wrestle with how do we adapt or relocate or move or persist, you know, species persist where they are. A uh, lot of challenging things to think about. And with this framework, uh, you know, with this question in mind for the Nature Conservancy, re we really begin to ask about how do we know that we're conserving the right places and how do we ensure that the places that we're conserving now are actually going to support a diversity of plants and animals tomorrow? It's a really important question for a land-based or water-based conservation organization because our investments are expensive, long-term, tangible investments and we want to make sure uh, that we're conserving the right areas. So that was the driver of this work. I'm going to go through how we've attempted to answer these questions um, really sort of with three little pieces. The first is on what we call conserving nature stage, which is thinking more about the physical environment itself than we have in the past. 
The second part is really on identifying and mapping climate resilient sites. And then the last part will just go through the next steps, how, how we're using the data now, how we're thinking about a permeable landscape, and that's where we'll get into the biodiversity hotspots in that last part. Uh, please, if I lose anyone, you know, feel free to chime in and ask questions if you get lost or let me know, or there'll be time for discussion at the end. Um, but let me start by backing up. So this is the eastern region of the, of the Nature Conservancy, and I began my work with the Conservancy as a community ecologist working in the field, and often we were inventorying for unique communities or for rare species. And the map that we most often used to help find things was a geology map, and that's because many, many types of, of rare species and unique communities are really very tied to their geology. For example, gopher tortoise in the southeast is really a specialist in loose sand. Um, Oglethorpe's oak is found only in highly mafic or serpentine environments. It's adapted to that situation. Uh, Tennessee cave salamander and all, all sorts of cave uh, invertebrates uh, are more, most highly concentrated in limestone regions, as are a lot of our freshwater mussels. You know, mussels need calcium to build shells. They really have their highest density and diversity in limestone areas. We also get limestone fen plants. You know, shale barrens are really where we find a whole bunch of rarities that are associated with those thistle shale slopes that get very hot and flake off. So uh, you can see that. I really began to wonder as climate change was emerging how much the, the eastern region can really rearrange, you know. So a lot of the ideas about rearranging uh, ecosystems and species are often really focused on very generalist, broad species and, and don't seem to be thinking about the whole set of species. And I realized we could do a couple tests of this to see how much the world could really range. And what I did was I just calculated uh, for every state in the east, I calculated a bunch of variables about their climate, uh, you know, the average rainfall, the average temperature, the high and low in the summer or winter, the amount of precipitation, the moisture. But then I also calculated a bunch of physical variables about every state, like how many different types of geology do they have, and What's the elevation range? What's the latitude? And what I discovered and published, uh, you know, probably eight or nine years ago now, was this remarkable relationship that where I found that the actual number of species in every state in the east and three Canadian provinces um, could be predicted almost exactly just by knowing four variables. And none of the climate variables were very good predictors of exactly how many species you have in a state. What were really good predictors were, was geology, the number of different geology types, the amount of limestone, the latitude of the state, and the elevation range. And the more I stared at this, I guess the first thing I thought, I didn't really believe this was true. I thought I had made a mistake. Um, so I did a lot of things to double check this relationship. And one thing I did was, you know, we don't know where every single species is, but we do know where most of the rare species are. So I did some overlays of rare species to see if this was even possible. And here's just some examples to, to, to make you think about this. So uh, this is a limestone valley um, in Tennessee. And there's 302 rare species that are really only found in these limestone areas. And they include you know, all the cave invertebrates and cave salamanders, a number of bats, uh, uh, fen-related plants like limestone fame flower, and uh, reptiles and amphibians that really prefer alkaline waters, particularly when they're juveniles. They like, they don't like acidic substrates. So you get, so you do get a lot of species uh, that are really restricted to that particular environment. And you can think about that compared with the coarse sand on the coastal plain, not even that far away from where we were just looking, you get a whole different set of species um, 
430 rare species that are really found only in this coarse sand. Many of the familiar things of the coastal plain, the longleaf systems, gopher tortoise, coach whip, red cockaded woodpecker. And of course, this environment is very different than limestone in that it, it is poorly, you know, it's nutrient poor, it drains, it's very uh, well drained, it tends to have a lot of fires, so you get these fire dependent uh, uh, systems. Again, the physical system itself is so dramatically different than the limestone system that, that it's the physical properties itself are really driving very, very big differences in species. And I tested that even further by just looking at rare species, not a completely fair test, I think, because rare species are rare to begin with, but sure enough, most rare species are only found in one or two types of geology. Only very rarely do you find rare species that, that are found across many different geologies. And in fact, the ones that have the, the, the settings that have the most rare species are calcareous settings, limestone, moderately calcareous, and coarse sand are the ones that have the most uh, species. So from another of different angles, this relationship seems to hold up very well. And I published this paper, and in the paper I argued that when we think about climate change, we should really think about making sure that we have conservation across all these different types of settings. And that's one way we can ensure that we're bringing the full suite of biodiversity with us together into the future. Um, and that we're not sort of leaving out some sets of species that are really uh, tied to a particular environment. So here you can see just the, several different physical environments themselves, and you can see visually how different they can be in their uh, uh, structure and, and uh, vegetation. So just to make this maybe make a little more sense to you spatially, here's a zoom in of North Carolina. And again, the argument is really, if you wanted to conserve the full diversity of North Carolina in a changing climate, so you know that things are going to change, a really good strategy is to make sure we have some of these, you know, purple, silty areas on the coastal plain, these orangey sand on over limestone areas, these dark brown areas of pure sand, like the sand hill, and then some of these lighter brown loam areas. So that gets you a, a different, a, a lot of the diversity there. As you move to the Piedmont, you want to make sure you get some granite areas, some sedimentary rock areas, and then some of those high mafic areas uh, and serpentine if you have them. And then as you get in the mountains, you want to look more for the high elevation granite, mafic, and sedimentary rocks. And if you were to move into uh, uh, Kentucky or Tennessee, you'd want to capture some of that calcareous valley there. And by making sure we have all of that captured in conservation, even as the world changes, we'll know that at least we're, we're creating the environments where species can come and go and still protect as many different types of species as possible. So within TNC, this idea uh, was a little radical when, at the time. And the way that I got the idea across, with a lot of help actually from Fish and Wildlife Service to develop this this analogy was to get people to think about a baseball team where, you know, any season the players themselves are the most important things, but over time the players change and there isn't any way to keep them there forever. So you have to think about the, how you maintain the players. You have to think about that by maintaining the stages themselves and the network of stages that connect with each other and that that way, over time, you can really maintain this diverse and thriving group of players. So from there, it turned out that uh, when I published Conserving the Stage paper, you know, a month before that paper came out, another paper came out from Paul Beyer in Arizona, where he, which he called the use of land facets to plan for climate change. And he's subtitled Conserving the Arenas, not the Actors. So very similar thinking from Paul. We didn't know each other at the time, but we started talking. We had both cited Mac Hunter, a uh, uh, conservation biologist in Maine, um, who had talked about the coarse filter many years ago, the physical environment as a coarse filter. 
And in our conversation, it turned out that a lot of scientists have come to this same conclusion. So we got, those, we got a group together, an international group together about two years ago in Baltimore, um, and we argued. We locked ourselves in a room for two days and argued about uh, this approach to conservation under climate change. And we actually agreed on a number of things, and the result of that was a special issue that came out last year in conservation biology on conserving nature's stage. And I encourage you to take a look at that issue. It, it, it discusses a lot of things about the, the ecological justification, biodiversity relationships, how it relates to ecosystem services, and, and what evidence there was that this strategy was important in past episodes of climate change. Okay, but in the, cons in the Nature Conservancy, the first thing we did was to see, well, are we already conserving, you know, examples of all these different stages? And, and so we did a simple analysis that you can see here of uh, protected lands, conservation lands, uh, and here in this graph, uh, areas that are in black or gray are, have been converted to development or agriculture areas in green are, are protected with either gap one or gap three uh, multiple use land. And what you can see here is that no, we, we have not actually done that great of a job. So limestone, dry flats, low elevation environments, fine sediments really have been highly converted and we don't have that much protection on them. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, alpine, very steep slopes, summits and ridges, uh, acidic environments like granite, those we have done much more conservation on. Um, and I think the take home message here is we've done much better conservation on these steep, harsh, acidic settings that are not really that valuable to people and we've had a hard time getting conservation into these fertile, moderate, highly valued environments. So the next question that came up really um, was, well then how how would we identify where to work if we were looking at these different physical settings? Is there any way we could identify places that we thought would be more resilient to climate change? And by resilient, I mean that they would conserve a diversity of species and functions, especially specialist species, even as the climate changes. So even if those species change over time, we would still have diverse functioning systems, whereas a vulnerable system would be one that is sort of becomes dominated by weedy generalist species that can do well anywhere. And it turns out that there are good examples of, of uh, physical features that build resilience, and they really have to do with these two things, many microclimates and highly connected, and I'll walk you through these two. But as I show you this map uh, and, and the GIS work you'll see in a minute, I want to acknowledge this has been done by a, a really great team uh, in, in the Eastern Conservation Science team who've done a lot of this GIS work. And it's also been guided by very large steering committees. In the southeast, we had 30 people, and in the northeast, 29. Uh, and in the southeast, we had, it included, uh, Amy and Rua were both on that, as well as a number of other partner organizations and some agency staff, too. Yeah, so. Okay, so here's the idea. The idea of microclimates is, is, and landform diversity is this. So if you are a species and you're in an environment like this, um, species actually experience their climate at a very local scale. Most species don't really experience the regional climate. They experience a local climate of moisture and temperature. And in, in, in a, a landscape like this, there's lots of different temperature and moisture combinations. You, from on a hot day, you could have very hot, dry slopes. Um, but over on the south-facing steep slope here, but over on the north-facing side, down in the lower cove, it could be 20 or 30 degrees cooler and you could have moisture in there. So if you are in this environment and the climate gets hotter or colder or moister or drier, you can move around and find your, your local climate needs just by moving around in your own landscape. 
if you have those microclimates available. So we, we spent some time trying to model species, what we call species-relevant microclimates. And this, this slide is just to show you that these these differences can be drastic, um, and there's a great book for those of you really interested called The Climate Near the Ground um, or, or The Boundary Layer Climates and really talks about how different the climate is really near the ground where you can find here's uh, temperature on, on south facing slopes versus north facing slopes in the heat of the day, you know, can be 20 degrees difference. Uh, they can also differ. Uh, versus the top of the slope versus the valley bottom. You know, they're cooler at the top, warmer in the valleys, moisture, drier at the top, moisture at the bottom, drier on the no on south facing, moisture on uh, north facing. So you have a lot of variation, even in a very gentle, these graphs are from this very gentle landscape, you know, uh, without much topography at all. So what we did was we mapped out a, a lot of rare species, uh, and you'll see these are these are rare species mapped against landforms, where we said each landform represents sort of a temperature moisture combination, um, like a south facing side slope or a south facing cove. And you'll see that some species are really specific; these big peaks very specific to one environment they like. They might be on two similar ones. Others are a little more gradual. They peak in coves, but you can find them in others. And to map this out, the way it looks like on the ground here, I hope we don't have any uh, snake phobia people on the call, but to look at timber rattlesnake, there's 20% more than expected are found on these very hot south-facing slopes. So that's really where they prefer to be. Um, but 18% are, are just a little farther at the slope base, still hot, but a little moister. There's a few that are up higher near the slope top, and then there's actually 2% that are on a north-facing slope, so not quite as warm. So over, if you look at this, you can see, okay, timber rattlesnake prefers this area, but they're already found in slightly different variations of that hot south slope. So you can imagine if this place gets warmer, then they would move and less of them would be on this very hot slope and more of the population would move into these other settings. Or if the, if the, if it gets colder, whoops, if it gets colder, then more of them would concentrate in the hotter settings. Here's the same map for mountain bugbane, which is more of a cove plant, you know, they can find their nearby setting as the temperature ranges. So the more options available, the better. So what we did was we mapped out land, landscape diversity, which, and it's based mostly on what I just showed you, landform variety, but we also modified it by elevation range and in the coastal plain by wetland score and soil diversity. And I'll give you uh, a little look at this elevation range did not affect the coastal plain much, but we looked for areas where there was more elevation range than you would expect from the landform diversity. We mapped those out. We mapped areas that had high density of wetlands and also a high patchiness of wetlands. And the green here is way above average for wetland density and patchiness. You see this really brings out the coastal plain. And we also looked for areas that have very high soil diversity, thinking that those, those offer sort of microtopographic differences in texture and moisture to a lot of systems. And when we finished that soil diversity, a lot of interesting places in the coastal plain of high soil diversity. So we put that in so that our final, <coughs> excuse me, our final map of landscape diversity is a combination of the landforms, which are the dominant piece, combined with the elevation, wetland density, or wetland score, and soil diversity. And this is what the final map looks like stratified by ecoregions. The map, the small insert map shows you the unstratified, so this is what it looks like if you looked at this entire region at once. But this is stratified, and I'll zoom in here. 
I find this map really interesting. So this is a zoom in of Georgia. If you look at the coastal plain here, you can see that the diversity of the landscape is really tracking the large river systems that are creating microclimates here and the fall line. And then you also find river systems out in the Piedmont and little hills that are creating microclimates uh, and then up again at the fall line going to the southern apse. Okay, let's see, I've got to speed myself up a little, so let me, uh, so we, the second part of this was to look at how connected an area was, so the, the thinking or the argument there is saying, well, it doesn't do much good to have a lot of microclimates around unless things can actually move around and get to those microclimates. So we did an analysis of how connected an area is for every point on the landscape. So if you see this black dot here, you know, you look at the land cover around it, how much natural cover before you hit a road or a development, maybe an agricultural field that would restrict movement. And then this blue area shows you how much movement is really unrestricted. And you can score that point in the center with essentially the size and area of that, of the unrestricted movement. And this is what it looks like when you score that for the southeast. Green, again, is above average, yellow is average, and brown is below average. And this is, the, this is for the region as a whole, where we're thinking areas that are highly connected are important for species movement and for processes like fire. And then we stratified that again by ecoregion. So here you go. So within, eco, within each ecoregion, where are the places that are most connected? And it brings up probably some familiar places to you on this landscape. Um, some of them are protected or some of them are, are really wet bottomland areas. And then we put these two things together saying that a site that we think will be more resilient, that will maintain species, are those that have a lot of microclimates um, in a connected landscape. So if they have both microclimates and they're highly connected, and then we applied that search image to each of the different types of geology and elevation. So here you're seeing the area for shale that has a lot of microclimates and connected. Up in the foreground is limestone. You have to find a separate one for limestone. Um, and here's what the diversity map looks like for the southeast, and here's what the connectedness map looks like for the southeast, both of these stratified by ecoregion and then put together one by one. So you, here's the granite in the Piedmont in gray. And then when you measure that out, the areas in green are the areas that have the most uh, microclimates in a connected landscape that land, that fall in granite on the Piedmont, okay? And so you get, you have to do many of these to get all the different environments together. But when you do, you get a composite map. Whoops. Oh, I'm missing the composite map. Hold on one second. There it is. So, oops. So here's the composite map. And I think you wanted to stare at this for a minute. So this map is showing you for each type of setting within each ecological region, where are the areas that have the most microclimates and are the most connected? And we thought, well, those would be really important places for maintaining resilience because species can persist there longer, climate change is buffered, they change will be slower, and they allow many options for things to rearrange. And if we did this work right, so next, the next I'm going to show you what's under the green. So if we did this right, when we look at what's under the green areas, we should see all the different types of geo geological settings. And sure enough, here we go. So this is just showing you what's under the highly resilient areas. And you do see uh, yellow is calcareous, orange is moderately calcareous, the brown is pure sand, Gray is granite, uh, 
orange is limestone under coarse sediment, purple is uh, fine sediment. And the p exciting thing about this, when we finally got to this point of the project, <laughs> The exciting thing was then to like start to look at what were the sites that were coming up in this analysis as being the most resilient or relatively the most resilient. And there's really an, an amazing set of sites that are selected by this method. And I should emphasize that I, sh I should be saying most resilient. So what's, what has the most microclimates and is the most connected in the coastal plain? is relative to itself, and it's not really being compared to the mountains, for example, and the mountains aren't being compared to the Cumberland. So the, the relative resilience is relative to the type of environment. And here's again a zoom in for North Carolina. So now you just see what's showing here are the places that were selected by this method as uh, above average for microclimates and connectedness. So we tested, thanks to the natural heritage programs who contributed rare species data for us to test and refine this model. Um, so the first thing we did, of course, is we overlaid all that rare species data on the resilient sites. <clears throat> the resilient sites total about a third of the landscape. So you know it's a quantitative analysis, so they everything has a score. So we just said uh, one above a half a standard deviation above the mean. It's about a third of the landscape. And in that third of the landscape, sort of surprisingly and, and kind of cool, 75 to 85% of all the rare species taxa can be captured in that landscape. So the implications of that are, are twofold. One, that a lot of the rarity in the landscape is concentrated already in these areas with lots of microclimates that are highly connected. Um, but the other implication is that about 15 to 25 percent of the rarity in this landscape is not found in a, a resilient landscape and is probably vulnerable to climate change. You know, they're, they're in a flat or fragmented habitat that is much more vulnerable to climate change. So the take home, the big take home message from this is that we tried to We've tried to argue we really can't know the future location of every plant and animal. We can't even predict exactly what the climate's going to do at the regional scale, let alone this very specific you know, species level scale. But we can identify places that are most likely to sustain native plants and animals into the future. Now we've written all this up in a number of papers and reports that are on our website, which you, it's all uh, open source and you can download this or you can download the data if you want to look at it. Okay, a couple things, a couple caveats. We didn't do the coast, so we white it, we grayed out the coast here because we didn't deal with sea level rise and we now, right now we have a grant from the North Atlantic LCC for the Northeast to work out the methods to look at coastal resilience. <clears throat> So we're in that process right now. Uh, we have created a web tool, and, and we're about to post that publicly in, in the next couple of weeks. But there is a, a version which you can look at if you want. Go to maps.tnc.org slash resilient land. And then a couple of good stories about what's happened since we released this uh, assessment. So certainly the most satisfying thing that's happened, at least from my perspective, is that the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, who's been very focused on climate change, um, but they have released $37 million that it has, is for specifically protecting resilient sites. $17 million of that is in land capital and $20 million is in a revolving fund. So that was uh, really exciting to see that happen. And a lot of those sites have now been chosen through the Open Space Institute or through the Central Apps Revolving Fund and are starting to come under protection. Another thing we did is we looked at the Nature Conservancy sites. And I really had to cross my fingers before we did this because uh, I wasn't sure what it would show. But what it shows, if you look at all our fee acres in the east, um, 
about half of them are in resilient sites. The interesting thing is about the other half of them are in sites that we called average. So they aren't in the very vulnerable sites, but they are in the average sites. And the implications of that is that those sites will probably need some form of management to really keep, to maintain the properties that brought us there in the first place. So that's now, uh, the Nature Conservancy now has this analysis worked into their site selection uh, process, the park process. Another exciting thing that happened after we released this was this White House priority agenda on enhancing the climate resilience of America's natural resources came out, and they really advocated to foster climate resilient lands and waters, which they defined as, as lands that uh, have characteristics that foster resilience include topographic and elevational diversity that provide a range of microclimates and minimal barriers that, that restrict movement. Um, so clearly very much on the same page on that, which was uh, exciting to see. Another application is the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, did a contract with us just to look at species and how species occurred across resilient sites. So for example, cow knob salamander 100% of the known populations of this species are in very resilient areas, sort of packed with microclimates, versus carpenter frog, um, where 95% of the known occurrences are in very flat and fragmented landscapes. So that doesn't tell you the whole picture, um, but it gives you an interesting perspective on the, vul the relative vulnerability of those two species. Uh, another thing is the North Atlantic LCC have used this. They worked it into their site prioritization. Um, and I really liked the model they used. Uh, I thought it made a lot of sense. So they sort of had this triangle, this three-way criteria where they looked at species, particularly rare species, high quality ecosystems, <clears throat> and then resilient lands. So the resilience was really brought engaged to bring in properties of the land itself. So you sort of have the quality of the system, the rare species, and the properties of the land itself. And I think those three together really tell you a lot about uh, uh, long-term resilience under climate change. I'll let uh, Rua and Amy can talk about uh, uh, how this has been used or, or integrated mostly after the fact, sort of an a priori uh, looking at sites in the South Atlantic from the first, this is from their first uh, conservation opportunity areas, and I'll, I'll let Rua talk about this uh, later. Or, uh, another thing is seeing how some, uh, many of the state agencies incorporated this information into their state wildlife action plans. That was good to see. Um, skip a few here and get to the end. Uh, so what's happened now, uh, we have just finished a revision for the East and we're working now on networks, which I'll show you one or two slides on, networks and biodiversity hotspots embedded within the resilience. But also the Resilience Now projects have started in the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and they have also been completed now in the Northwest and uh, Northern California. So it, it, uh, it's gotten a lot of traction across the country, this type of analysis. We're, we have started to think about how this applies to freshwater systems. We can talk about that uh, uh, offline or later in the questions if you're interested. <clears throat> uh, I think it has some really interesting applications for freshwater. And we're still looking, we're looking for funding really for to do a freshwater analysis for the southeast. And then last thing I want to show you, I want to show you this one piece and then I'll stop talking. Uh, we've now been really trying to get our minds around landscape permeability and linkages between the resilient sites. And one of the most interesting analysis we've done, we've done this circuit scape analysis of the whole region as to how flows might, 
might move or concentrate across the landscape to facilitate rain shifts. And if you take that flow map and if you summarize it by floodplain areas to find out where, where are the riparian areas or the floodplain areas that, that perhaps will channel a lot of migration and movement as we see rain shifts, the area that really comes out for the region is the southeast coastal plain and all those riverine systems that connect the coastal plain to the Piedmont. Here's a zoom in of areas con that connect, that have a lot of regional flow moving through them in the coastal plain and Piedmont. And we've been able to take those, these, these specific riparian areas and join that with another query where we looked at where do we have confirmed biodiversity. So we take, again, thank you to the natural heritage programs who've shared this information for us to use. Where do we have really high numbers of species taxa um, concentrated in a resilient area? So you see the resilience in the gray in the background. Where do those two things come together? And it's allowed us to start doing queries that we've really only been dreaming of up till this point. But now you can see here's a query where we look for areas that have high resilience based on microclimates and connectedness, high confirmed biodiversity based on rare species taxa, and they are connected. So where are the riparian areas that have a lot of connectivity and flow going through them that connect resilient areas with high biodiversity? And that's what you see in orange and green here, with the orange ones being that the areas that need more protection and the green being fairly well protected. So finally, we're getting into this part this area where we can start to really assemble this information in ways that I think will really drive us towards a conservation network um, that could retain species under climate change. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I went a little over my half an hour. I didn't mean to. No, you're uh, fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, we have a fabulous turnout today, so I'm hoping we get some good questions. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks obviously interested in this project. Before we jump into that, I did want to give Amy Arua a chance to talk about um, how we've integrated that resilient biodiversity hotspots indicator. Into Mute off. A lot has changed um, in that regard since Blueprint 1.0. Does one of you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, this is Rua. I can, I can go ahead and hit that. So. Um, so in Blueprint 2.0, um, actually in some similar ways as, as, as in the, the North Atlantic, so the, 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 um, the resilience, both the, the diverse, those kind of resilient sites that Mark showed at the end, uh, that became one of the landscape indicators for the South Atlantic LCC and so was used formally in the Blueprint prioritization as one of the uh, landscape indicators. And so that covers all of um, the, the terrestrial ecosystems. So this gets folded in formally, um, you know, in addition to the bigger patch size, the connectivity metrics, um, and other components. So that those resilient sites, as of 2.0, um, were in there. In 2.0, it was a fairly simplified sort of yes/no, um, above a threshold or not. And in this next version, 2.1, which you'll be seeing a draft of pretty soon, that is it's incorporated in a more continuous way. Um, so that brings out even more of the nuance of, of, of this method. So um, yeah, it's, it's actually one of the ways that the, the Blueprint 2 and beyond are sort of bringing in these questions about how do you make sure your network is resilient uh, to climate change. Well, that's great, Rua. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So does anyone want to jump in with questions? Um, feel free to type into the chat box or just remember star six to unmute. Uh, this is Rick in Region 4. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Great. Uh, Mark, I've got a question for you in, in regards to uh, private landholders. Did you get any sort of blowback from, from them and having their property identified as, uh, you know, a biodiversity hotspot for resiliency? Um, maybe, maybe not just private landholders, but, uh, you know, timber companies and things like that. Uh, that's a great question, Rick. 
the the answer is not really. So the answer is we used to get we used to get tons of that, and as far as I can tell, since with the admin of Google Earth and you know these wide public data sets, that that has really disappeared. So we've gotten very little blowback now on public lands. I think people have just started to realize their lands are visible to the greater world. I'm, I'm that makes sense. Uh, we do have a question on the chat box from Cindy Carr with North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Is the analysis available as GIS data for states to use? Uh, yes, it is. So you can go to the, I should have had this up here, you can go to the Conservation Gateway. If you type in Conservation Gateway, uh, or if you type in Terrestrial Resilience Southeast, it'll take you there, and you can download the data sets. Uh, either simplified versions or all, all the data sets in their full complexity and the reports, and we're happy to help you, you if you get stuck trying to use them. That's a great question, and we do have these data sets available, the, the, how, how they've been modified to serve as, as ecosystem indicators in the blueprint. Those data sets are available on the Conservation Planning Atlas as well, although, of course, for your purposes, Cindy, those wouldn't cover the whole state of North Carolina in indicator form, but we have the data sets on the CPA as well. And the entire, um, the entire original data are on the CPA as well, if you just want to explore it without having to download first. Awesome. Oh, that's great. So lots of good places to find the GIS data. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We, we definitely have some more time, so don't be shy. Uh, this is Rick again. I'm, I've got lots of questions. Um, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has these 407 uh, species that are up for listing. Uh, have you looked at uh, at those species in relation to the um, you know, you kind of how you had the 100 percent of one species was protected and 95 percent of another was really not in the in the range? Have you done an analysis for them across those species yet? So we're, we're doing an analysis for the Southeast species. We're doing that analysis right now, and that, that will be available in a couple of months. Uh, and so I'm happy to let you know when that's available. The, the one that I showed, it was done only for the Northeast with some funding from the Northeast Fish and Wildlife, so. And are you, are you working with uh, the Southeast Climate Adaptation Strategy, the CECAS work that's going on? Or are you planning to be in Baton Rouge? No, not so much. So I've been working with SEERS, the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I have not worked very much with the Southeast Climate Center. And I, I would jump in on the, the, that conservation adaptation strategy because so much of it is coming, um, a lot of the engagement is coming through each individual cooperative. Um, so you're, without even knowing it, uh, you know, your efforts in the North Atlantic LCC, the South Atlantic, and some of the other of incorporating the resilience is already part of the strategy itself. Um, right. But I think what you said as well, Rick, I think there might be some interesting um, context when we're working on adding all of this up. So that, that strategy is really, you know, bringing together that, that, the work of the SEERS and what's going on with the cooperative and then stitching all this stuff together at the full uh, – area across the south. Um, so, so yeah, you, you already even not knowing it have been part of it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think you, you have some good perspective as we start trying to do these things across, stitch stuff together across the whole south. Great. And that CCAST effort, the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, we will have um, some concrete spatial data to show um, by October of this year a draft integration of all of the spatial prioritizations coming out of all the LCCs in the southeast. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how how that all stitches together and and potentially how to explore the role that the resilience data has played in that. Oh, that's exciting. That's that's in September, did you say? It's 
scheduled for October of this October. year. Yeah, and okay. uh, there's going to be a lot of activity around that, as Rick mentioned, at the upcoming CAFWA meeting in Baton Rouge. Um, Anybody else want to jump in? I, I didn't have a, a question. This is John and uh, Region 4 just uh, requested uh, if we could possibly get a copy of the presentation. I'd appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, we actually Absolutely. record all of these um, webinars and we'll post the slides. They're going to be uploaded onto the calendar event on the South Atlantic LCC website. Um, so if you go to the events page and click on this webinar, there'll be something added to the description that says archives, presentation, and, and web recording. Okay, great. And that'll be up probably this afternoon or tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else before we move on to updates from your cooperative? Well, thanks again, Dr. Anderson. That was a fabulous presentation. I'm going to take the presenter power back now and just share a couple more slides to wrap up. So we have one quick staff update this month. Um, the big news here at the South Atlantic LCC is the upcoming draft release of Blueprint 2.1. So Rua, I'll hand it off to you to talk about that briefly. Sure. So we've made a whole bunch of improvements um, from a lot of your, your comments and in, in workshops and other things from Blueprint 2.0. Uh, made a number of improvements to the indicators, especially improvements in urban open space, uh, working lands, freshwater aquatic, and uh, the marine environments. Uh, so we've been pulling all that stuff together, updating the, the blueprint based on some, some even better data. And so we'll actually, um, first week of May, keep your eye out, you'll get in if you're a member of the South Atlantic LCC website, you'll get an email um, announcing that the, the review is done. And then so we'll have spatial layers up for you to play around with, take a look at, and um, you know, provide some comments back. And we'll also be having a special, our next web forum is going to be uh, an opportunity to, to discuss and review and an overview of the 2.1 updates. Um, so expect to see that very, very soon. Uh, smoke is pouring out of all the computers and been doing some <laughs> targeted validation and looking based on other data sets and, and having people look over it. So expect that very soon. Exciting stuff. And thank you for that beautiful segue to our preview of next month's web forum. Um, that's going to be May 19th, same time, same place, right here at 10 a.m. And our very own Rua Mordecai, your Cooperative Science Coordinator, will be giving that talk. Um, and as Rua mentioned, we'll be reviewing a draft of Blueprint 2.1 actually on that web forum. So this can be an alternative or an additional way to provide feedback um, other than that online review option that Rua just talked about. So Rua is going to give us an overview of how this next version of the Blueprint was developed and particularly highlight the indicator updates that were incorporated into Blueprint 2.1. So you're going to have a chance to share your comments and prioritize the most important issues for staff to address. And we'll try to fix everything that we can before Blueprint 2.1 is finalized. And then anything that we can't solve in that short time is going to lay that really, really critical foundation for future improvements to the Blueprint and inform the known issues for this version. So. We know you guys have heard a lot if you've tuned into our web forums about the lean startup process, our commitment to continually iterate, iterating and improving our products. So we know that Blueprint 2.1 isn't going to be perfect, and we want to communicate any issues there transparently. Um, so just to give you a sense of the timeline, the steering committee for the South Atlantic LCC is going to consider approval of Blueprint 2.1 at its June 2016 in-person meeting. So that's just a couple months away. And then finally, we always want to make sure folks know how they can get involved in the cooperative. Rua mentioned um, joining the web community. If you join the web community, you'll get access to our monthly newsletter and a reminder about this monthly web forum. And in addition to that, you can always connect with a staff member, another member of the cooperative. And we always encourage you to explore the blueprint online. With that, I'm going to open the floor for any additional questions folks might have before we sign off. Just remember star six to unmute.
All right, not hearing any. That's it for today. 10.57, got out a couple minutes early. Um, thanks again, Dr. Anderson, for that great talk. Thank you for having me. All right, appreciate you joining us, everyone. Hope to see you next month. Thank you. Happy Thursday. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.